Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to a very special day for us, and a very special day, I believe, for the class of 2016. And uh, we're very happy to see all of you. And I suspect as happy and anxious as you all are to be here today, we're probably equally happy and anxious to have you all here today. And as I look out in, at all of you, it's somewhat reminiscent of interview day. And I'm glad many of you got to use your same outfits over again <laughs> more than that one time. So you look great. You look great. So um, I'm going to say a few words, and, and this really is the kickoff of uh, your time with us at this medical school. And we're very pleased to have you here. Uh, today concludes part of a journey for all of you, and it concludes part of a journey for us as well. But it really begins a much longer journey for you and a much longer journey for the school. And I ask that you think about that uh, today. This begins your career in medicine. This begins your careers in the profession of medicine. And from this day forward, people will look at you in a different way than they did yesterday. Uh, they will think of you in a much different light, even though nothing's really changed since yesterday. So I ask you to think about that. For us at the medical school, this is a beginning for us. This is a beginning for us to start educating a different type of physician. And one of the reasons that the members of this charter class are here is because we do believe that you will be different kinds of physician. And we look forward to helping you and nurturing you in this journey. So today I welcome you not only to CMSRU, but to the profession of medicine. And allow me to address uh, both of these. Like many of you, I spent the last two weeks, um, in addition to doing a few things around here, watching the Olympics. And uh, it was a great, a great event, as, as it always is. And I was thinking about today, and I was thinking about some of the similarities of today to the Olympics. And people are probably saying, well, you know, what, how, do you, how do you figure that out? Well, I was thinking about, really, about the Olympic flame. And, and the story about the Olympic flame is that it really uh, was first lit back at the beginning of the games in the 20th century. And uh, it was lit uh, as to recognize the, uh, the theft of fire by Prometheus from Zeus. And this was a very big thing to the Greeks. And so they chose to have a flame capture uh, the, and, and recognize the Olympics year after year after year. And so, as you all know, what happens probably several months before the Olympic Games begin is the torch is lit, and the torch is lit in Athens where the Games began. And then it is transported to the site of the Olympic Games, and the torch is lit. And the torch is lit and throughout the Games, and it's, it's extinguished, as I suspect a number of you saw uh, last night. So I want to use an analogy here in terms of our torch being lit, and I'll make some comments about the logo. And the torch of this medical school was really lit 40 years ago. It was lit out in Cherry Hill when a number of individuals from Cooper and from Camden and from the region had a dream, a dream of starting a medical school here in Camden. And it was obviously a long journey, a 40-year journey to today. And we had the opportunity to recognize many of the individuals who contributed to that at our grand opening celebration that was three weeks ago. So there are a lot of people who carried the torch over that 40 years. And unlike the Olympic torch, it wasn't extinguished at the end of four years or a decade. It really remains until this day. And behind you, and in this room, are a very small portion of the people who helped carry that torch. And I want you all to recognize them. These are the people who helped contributed to this school. These are the people who will be with you every step of the way. Uh, it is but a small portion of everybody who will be involved and has been involved in your education. So I ask you to recognize the deans and the faculty and staff of the medical school. So let me talk a little bit about the logo. And I asked Dr. McGeehan to put the logo up there. And for those of you who are unaware of how this logo came about, it really uh, came about back in 2009, I believe, when um, Cooper and Rowan came together to create this school. 
And actually they chose the colors based on yellow from the Rowan colors and red from the Cooper colors. And for those of you, we have two Sherry and Mike are Rowan grads and they know that the logo of Rowan University is a torch. And the decision was made to use that same, um, same type of flame, but to rotate it. And if you remember the staff as of Asclepius, which is the symbol of medicine, it is the staff with the snake coiled around it. And you can see that the flame is turned there. So again, takes us back uh, to the Olympics. So the difference is, again, our torch does not go out. This torch remains lit and will remain lit for the remainder of your careers and the remainder of the time that this medical school is in existence. And this also signifies our commitment to you as well as our challenge to you to set the standards for everyone that follows you. And you recall that during uh, interviews, I mentioned to all of you that being part of this charter class carried with it certain set of responsibilities and obligations, and you'll hear more about those during this week, but I know you're up to it. So I ask you all to light your own torch today. Let me also welcome you to the profession of medicine. I was thinking back to my first year of medical school, low those many years ago, when I uh, went to medical school at Georgetown. I remember very early on being in gross anatomy, gross anatomy lab one night. We were there and we were, we were studying. It was an interesting time. This was uh, post, I'm going to date myself here, post Woodstock, uh, Vietnam War time. So it was an interesting group of classmates uh, that I had. You can imagine the array of personalities that we had. And so we were there one night working and, and one of my classmates started talking about the profession of medicine. And he said, you know, I don't think there's any profession in this country that has a greater ability to impact people's lives in medicine. He said, the closest thing that I can think of is being a justice on the Supreme Court. So we thought about that and we laughed about it and it was an interesting, it was an interesting comment and I'm not sure whether it's true or not, but it's certainly something that I've remembered during this time frame. And it is a privilege to be in this profession, uh, to get to know people and see people at their most vulnerable, uh, to see them in an intimate way that few people have to see them. So I ask you to think about that as you go forward. Even when times get a little dark and the torch may dim a little bit and uh, you're, you're wondering, you know, what did I get myself into? Please, please remember that. So as this day begins your profession, a member of a profession of medicine, I ask you to re remember that. And as I close, I want to ask you only four things. These are the four things I ask of you. Uh, number one, enjoy each and every day that you're in this profession. That begins today. Uh, as tough as it may be, this is a, a lot of fun, and I ask you to enjoy that. And try to remember that during some of the times in the coming year when you're, God forbid, looking at the Krebs cycle or something like that. Uh, just, <laughs> just remember that this is really a time to enjoy. The other second thing I ask you is to maintain and nurture your excitement about medicine the passion and the commitment to care and service that you have on this day. Uh, medical schools do a pretty good job of taking a group of young men and women and wearing them down. Uh, and sometimes the passion and empathy that uh, you all have on a day like today diminishes over time. And know that our commitment is to help you grow those rather than have them diminish. But remember how you feel today and try to carry that with you throughout the rest of your career. Third, I ask you to live the mission, vision, and values of this school. When we uh, decided, Dr. Weil and I were talking a few months ago about what was going to be on the, on the plaque that recognized the opening of the medical school. And we got into a long discussion about maybe it should be a picture of the building. And then we thought, well, why should we have a picture of the building on the building since you can see the building? And then we talked about uh, how do we recognize all the people that contributed to the school, and we realized that there was not a plaque big enough to capture all of that. And, and plus there are many people who, who believe, I think that their roles were actually greater in creating this medical school than they actually were. Uh, and finally we said, well, why don't we focus on the thing that is dearest to us and that's our mission and core values. And we put it there as a reminder for all of us and for all of you and for everyone who comes after you about what this medical school is about. And one of the reasons that you were selected to be part of this class is because we believe that you could help us carry out this mission. So I ask you to think about that uh, as you walk through those doors every day. And finally, 
I ask you to remember your role as a charter class. And as we talked about during the interview season, there will only be one charter class in this medical school ever. And with that carries a responsibility, unfortunately for all of you, but I also think fortunately for you, since you can set the traditions and legacies that you'd like to see in the classes that come after you. And as you'll also recall, we talked a little bit about the time capsule, which is out in the lobby, which is now empty, and which you and others will help decide what goes into. And part of what we're going to ask everyone to do is think about not just how this medical school got here, but what your vision is for this school, what our collective vision is for this school. And in 50 years, actually 51 years, in the year 2063, I hope all of you will come back and open that time capsule and think about what it was like today and think about where this school wound up and see if we got it right, see if we collectively got it right. So again, my thanks to all of you. Thank you for joining us on this great journey. Welcome to a great day. We're very excited. And again, thank you so much for being part of this journey with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. This is a very special moment for me because I get to tell everybody about how special the 50 so well-dressed individuals in this audience are. It was only a few short weeks ago that I thought, how do we introduce them properly? They are the first class. They are the beginning. And I thought, maybe a charter. So I sat down on a Saturday morning, and I start to write a charter a charter that they could come up and sign. I went about one sentence, which about the most I could handle, and then I said, now wait a minute, it's their charter. It's not my charter. So I did what they're used to me doing almost every day. I emailed them all. <laughs> they're laughing because they know that's true. And I told them, I said, you know, this is your charter. I'd like you to write it, having no idea what I did hoping I did the right thing. And before long, and I'm talking hours, I'm getting emails back. They set it up on Google Docs so that everybody could participate. They set up a writing committee, an editing committee, a research committee, all because they're on Facebook together, constantly talking to each other. And they're a class long before they ended up here in this auditorium. And they wrote a charter that far surpassed anything I could have dreamed of, much less write. And because of that, for me to write, read this charter would be equally unfair. So I said, who's going to read it? A bunch of emails. Aaron and Amanda should read it. So Aaron and Amanda, please come up and read the school's charter. On this, the 13th day of August, 2012, we, the inaugural class of Cooper Medical School of Rowan University, do solemnly commit ourselves to uphold the mission and core values of the college stated herein. Cooper Medical School of Rowan University is committed to providing humanistic education in the art and science of medicine within a scientific and scholarly community in which inclusivity, excellence in patient care, innovative teaching, research, and service to our community are valued. Our core values include a commitment to diversity, personal mentorship, professionalism, collaboration and mutual respect, civic responsibility, patient advocacy, and lifelong learning. With said mission and values as our guide, we make the following promises to the medical profession, the city of Camden, Cooper Medical School of Rowan University, our classmates, and ourselves. To the medical profession, we pledge to support the view of medicine as a team effort that works to drive healthcare in a direction that allows everyone access to the care they need. To conduct ourselves with empathy, respect, and tolerance in order to serve as an example of community-centered, patient-oriented medical care. 
to be accountable for our actions and to shoulder the responsibilities inherent in making positive changes in the delivery of health care, to embrace lifelong learning and discovery, and to constantly question where improvements can be made, to promote health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. To the city of Camden, above all else, we promise to serve to advocate for its citizens by educating and empowering them to take active roles in their own health care and that of the community as a whole, to work with CMSRU faculty to provide quality care to its residents in order to engender trust and respect with the hope of assisting in the revitalization of the community, to constantly strive for a greater sense of cultural diversity such that we never lose sight of the specific needs of Camden citizens, to enact sustainable change and to create connections to the community by providing practical and accessible healthcare options that endure past the end of our time at CMSRU. To provide service beyond the traditional delivery of healthcare by encouraging healthy lifestyles that encompass physical, behavioral, emotional, and social wellness. To Cooper Medical School of Rowan University, we commit ourselves to the creation of a collaborative learning environment that fosters cooperation among the classes of CMSRU. To establish CMSRU as an institution that strives to improve itself by developing positions who value diversity of thought, professionalism, and a passionate commitment to their work. To help CMSRU affirm its place at the forefront of facilitating positive changes in healthcare. To assert ourselves as an example to future students through our dedication to our studies, our leadership in the CMSRU community, and our service to the city of Camden to embody the mission and core values of CMSRU and to incorporate the college's vision into our approach to our medical education and into our future practice. To our classmates, we vow to challenge and to inspire one another, to create a dynamic community in which we learn from and with one another in a respectful, professional, patient, and honest manner to draw strength from our individual differences, experiences, and opinions in order to broaden our perspectives and to enhance our growth together as one unified class. To listen to one another and view each individual's unique qualities as a bridge rather than a barrier to our end goals. To reinforce the notion of healthcare as a collaborative effort by supporting one another through shared challenges and difficult experiences. To ourselves, we resolve to act professionally and respectfully in order to represent ourselves and CMSRU positively in the medical community. To commit ourselves to lifelong learning, not only in the field of medicine specifically, but also in the evolving world around us. To keep an open mind and to learn from our patients, fellow students, and professors. To hold ourselves accountable, to admit our shortcomings, and con to continually work to better ourselves and our practice. To be confident in the face of adversity, to have the courage to challenge popular thought and to stand up for our beliefs, to live mindfully such that we remain healthy individuals capable of gracefully managing the challenges of demanding professional and personal lives. To this end, we are steadfast in purpose and in focus on community-centered health care that values altruism, respect, and mutual trust. We envision the formation of meaningful relationships with patients, inviting them to participate in the maintenance and improvement of their own overall health. We shall uphold collaboration across disciplines in order to eliminate disconnected, ineffective care. We commit ourselves to the practice of medicine in such a way that community-centered and patient-centered care are harmoniously delivered so that preventive care for all is emphasized without compromising the comfort, safety, or privacy of individuals. It is our hope that the students who follow us continue to, uh, to build upon the connections that we make in the community and to remain resolute in the commitment to create tangible changes in Camden. We encourage continued reliance on one another for help and guidance to maintain both the thirst for knowledge and the determination to succeed, while never settling for anything less than excellence. With the example we set as their guide, subsequent generations of CMSRU students will strive to be compassionate, well-informed healthcare providers, while promoting unity within and among all present and future classes of CMSRU. Finally, for ourselves, we hope to inspire others to live healthfully by providing them with the knowledge to make informed decision, decisions about their well-being, to never allow personal beliefs to prejudice patient care, and to incite, through the way we live our own lives, a sense of urgency in others about the importance of health and wellness in how they live theirs. With, with these, these guidelines, guidelines foremost in our minds, we do thus commit ourselves to the profession of medicine, the perpetual pursuit of knowledge, and a life of service to our patients and to our community.
Wow. With that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Raboli. Uh, long before I even knew that this incredible institution was going to be, Dr. Raboli and so many others were working to make it what it has become. And I think it's only fitting that she get the opportunity to introduce to everyone here our inaugural class. Annette? After they're introduced, they will stand, come to the front of the room, and sign that incredible document that they just read. Good morning and welcome class of 2016, our charter class. What a magnificent charter you have put together. Uh, I, I sat there and was just amazed uh, and felt quite emotional about it. I hope that during the course of your careers that you hearken to this, that you preserve it as your sacred center in all that you do in good times and in bad. As I call your names individually, please come up and sign this charter, which is your pledge to your profession. Jenny Okpe. Jordan Barger. Christian Barrios. Ryan Belakonich. Jennifer Blesnack. Michelle Breda. Ian James Brown. Gita Byrea. Gwen Caffrey. Holly Caton. Abimanyu Shandell. Gabriela Chaviano. Michael Coletta. Nicole Diaz Segara.
Fletcher Drogos. Ernest Ego. Daniel Eisman. Sherry English. Lena Fan. Marcy Fornari. Denise Garcia. Robert Goldberg. Catherine Gussman. Emo Ekpot. Kath Heaton. Cynthia Kroll. Carlito Logman. Rebecca Lee. Daniel Leffler. Juan Lopez. Amanda McCarthy. Brian McCauley. Aaron McIntosh.
Catherine McMacken. Atlee Melillo. Jacqueline Park. Yash Patel. Sandra Pena. Matthew Robbins. Brittany Scarpato. Erica Schramm. Guru Raj Shan. Etty Sims. James Stefano. Stephanie Stoneback. Susan Talamini. Martin Weaver. Joshua Weinstock. Kathy Williams. Sarah Zaidi.
Welcome to CMSRU and welcome to the profession of medicine. Give yourselves a round of applause. Whoa. Now we'll do some handwriting analysis and really see what's going on. Um, I have the honor of giving you your first lecture. And there will be no test. Uh, do not take notes. This will not be on Blackboard. Uh, this is just going to be something I felt I wanted to do. So please put up with me during it. Um, I'm very, very honored to be a member of this profession. And now I'm equally honored to welcome you into it. It's really an amazing life. You are our inaugural class. As Dr. Katz said, there will be no others. And having you here is a true honor. But who are you? For those of you in the back who have yet to really meet these incredible people, there are 50 very unique individuals, as you can see, already working as one. The charter is the example of that. They'd not even come together, but through something called Facebook, which I'm entirely unaware of, Valerie, uh, they were able to do this. They're responsive. They return my emails. My kids don't do that. Uh, very, very thoughtful, as written in that document. And more importantly to me, fun. Some of the emails I got back were a hoot. A potpourri of Myers-Briggs. Everyone here took the Myers-Briggs test. And for a sample size of 50, Patty, having every different type represented shows how uniquely bizarre you are. <laughs> and we embrace that. We welcome that. And you'll learn more about that from Patty Vanston later in the week. You're mixed learners. We had you each take the Learning Connections inventory. And you're all over the place. Everybody's different. It made it quite a challenge assigning you to the active learning groups. But I think we ended up with a very nice mixture. You're Facebookers, uh, something that is quite, quite interesting. And you're going to be those who will help us, who will walk alongside of us on the journey of building this school. And the reason you were chosen is because you all have the capacity for excellence. Now that you're here, the others in this room will allow you the opportunity to become excellent. What are the objectives of this little talk? I like to look at the past and learn. As you get older, the past becomes very important. Observe the present and act. There are some things going on now that we need to mention. Imagine the future and prepare you for it. And realize that fundamental to this incredible profession is caring. And to talk a little bit about that. Sometimes it's important to read a slide, and this, the definition of professionalism by the American College of Physicians, is worth reading. Medicine is not a trade to be learned, but a profession to be entered. A profession is characterized by a specialized body of knowledge that its members must teach and expand by a code of ethics and a duty of service that put patient care above self-interest and by the privilege of self-governance granted by society. This is the type of profession that you enter today. Can anybody tell me? I, there's going to be a little quizzes as we go on. And these quizzes are directed to our final 50, not to the rest of you. So can any of you 50 tell me what the name of this is? This was a practice called trephination. And many, many years ago in the practice of medicine, this was a hole drilled in a head to release the evil humors that were causing the malady at the moment. Now, when they were drilling this hole, I don't think they thought this was dumb. It was state of the art. And indeed, many of the things we're doing in medicine now, hundreds of years from now, they'll look back and say, that was dumb. But we don't know it now. So all that you learn, you're going to relearn. Some of it you'll unlearn, and you'll learn more. To me, that's the great magic of medicine. 
very little that I do now when I see a patient is what I did scientifically back then, but interpersonally it continues to evolve. Can anybody tell me who this gentleman is? Ignace Semmelweis was an Austrian obstetrician who happened to notice that the women in the beds next to the woman who got sick were also getting sick and proposed there was a substance that was being transmitted by the physician and the caregivers from bed to bed causing this illness called puerperal fever. He actually wrote a small book on this. And his award for this was what? He was basically laughed out of the profession, said he was crazy, ended up stopping practice, and then later in life, he only lived into his 40s, he developed an acute abdomen, ended up having an operation and dying of a wound infection. So having vision, having insight, looking at the future, seeing things differently, isn't always rewarded. Medicine in the overall spectrum of time is an incre incredibly modern science. If you go back some 4,000 years ago, you had the pyramids built. Incredible technology to do that. Up until 500 or so years ago, the only education was word of mouth. Then we started printing books. And here at our school, we've ended up getting rid of them. Everything's electronic now. But the use of a stethoscope, listening to the physical body, is a very modern phenomenon. So let's look at medical history. Only about 160 years ago was ether used in surgery by, I guess, what would have been the first major anesthesia advance Michael Goldberg, our Associate Dean of Academic Affairs, has carried on in the tradition of anesthesia. But before then, it was a bottle of whiskey and a leather strap you bit on. Rather inhumane. Bacteria in the air. Nobody even thought about it until 1860, when Pasteur nailed this down. Those whose names were introduced by Dr. Raboli that is indeed her background, studying infectious disease. Perhaps the greatest advance in medicine occurred in, of all places, Poughkeepsie, New York. Anybody tell me what that was? It was the first citywide water filtration system installed. And you will learn at this school, public health, looking at society, looking beyond the individual is what we must do. And rubber gloves by Halstead. Anybody tell me this person with the perfect hairline, who this is? This is Benjamin Rush. And Benjamin Rush was a physician in colonial times, but a signer of the Declaration of Independence. And one of the things I want you to get out of this today is that you have to be more than a physician to be a great physician. He is one of the four advisory colleges is named after Benjamin. Then going on to a little over 100 years ago, the first real medication that's still used today, and in fact expanded aspirin. Up until 1950, if you died, you died. Nobody thought why. So the use of death certificates. Up until 1921, every insulin-dependent diabetic died. That was just yesterday. And up until the 1940s, if you didn't have a good immune system or a surgeon who could lance a boil, you died of a simple infection. Anybody want to tell me who this person is? Elizabeth Blackwell. Why is her name up there in her picture? This is the first documented trained female physician in this country. And I say documented because others were, but couldn't have it put up there on a banner the way it should have been. And your class today shows how wonderfully far we've come. Another advisory college. 
In 1956, in the 50s, and this is times that I remember well now, death was something that we thought we could overcome. Medicine started to change in its thinking. Just because your heart stopped, big deal, we'll get it back. CPR, up until 1958, if you died, you died. Nobody tried to bring you back. In 1967, the first heart transplant. In 1970, the first pacemaker. That indeed was yesterday when you think about the pyramids that were up there. And who is this dapper gentleman? The reason I didn't want anybody but you answering is we're getting to the point now where I expect some of the individuals in this room were classmates of the pictures. No. Uh, <laughs> William Osler. William Osler, one of the most noted physicians of all time, who took medicine out of the classroom to the bedside. Differential diagnosis, looking at the patient, training the student at the bedside, and William Osler is another one of the advisory colleges. And then we get into the modern medical history. A lot of this is now diagnosis related. The first CAT scan in 73. The only disease we've ever called an end to is smallpox. The MRI scan where we could look inside the human body without x-rays. And then people started entering the hospital. Many of my fellow physicians remember this. And everybody thought if we just did another test, if we tried another medication, if we kept them alive on a machine a little bit longer, we'd find the cure. Until the people stood up and said, no, we want some autonomy. We want a say over what is done to us. And the Patient Self-Determination Act came into existence with living wills and durable power of attorneys. To me, this is a big deal. This the last is even a bigger deal. You're here. And our last advisory college director name? Harvey Cushing. Basically the father of neurosurgery. Took surgery to that next level where no one would go, looking inside the brain. The name of this? Isn't it embarrassing now? Right? I put up five of the greatest medical figures of all time, and every one of you said Dolly when this came up. We have a lot of work to do with you. And indeed, Dolly is the name. Hard to believe that was almost 15 years ago. They cloned a sheep, and everybody thought, every science fiction lover, that we'd be cloning humans by now. Thank God we're not. And it's not just the technology, it's people knowing right from wrong. And that is going to be woven through everything you see and do in the next four years. In February of 2001, the Human Genome Project came together, opening up the door to genetics, both the wonders and the ethical complications. The internet, probably the greatest opening to ethical problems. This, in fact, is the biggest ethical problem in our country. It's a total embarrassment. The Affordable Care Act has gone quite a ways, but nowhere near enough. And we're going to look to you to take it to that next level, to make sure that no human being is denied any level of care because of their financial ability or their background. And I congratulate you on putting that in the charter. The Ethics Manual of the American College of Physicians states some aspects of medicine are fundamental and timeless. Medical practice, however, does not stand still. Clinicians must be prepared to deal with changes and reaffirm what is fundamental. And this is our current problem. We have incredible diagnostic techniques being developed every day. The cost of pharmaceuticals, preventive medicine, rising malpractice costs, unknown future developments, the cost of caring for our uninsured, all are increasing the health care cost. This is decreasing the workforce, and it all goes back to skyrocketing health care. If you look at diagnostics, we've gone from CAT scan to MRI scan, now to PET scan, and with each, 
is a major jump in cost. If you cross the street near Cooper and develop chest pain, look out, okay? You're going to have all of this done. The PSA test, interesting, when it came out, everybody thought this would be the end of the death of prostate cancer. And in fact, recent studies have shown it's opened the doors to multiple, multiple problems. And we're going to see that with almost everything on this list. Pharmacy costs. It used to be a swig of Maalox or a little 7-Up, and now you could walk in with a little reflux, and the next thing you know, you could be paying $1,000. The cost for that chest pain. What used to be handled with a Kleenex now can cost you 350 bucks. And what each of you are going to learn while you're here is evidence-based medicine so that you could do the right thing, not just for the patient in front of you, but for society. So we have skyrocketing health care. This is our current problem. We need you to solve it. Many of us in this room actually caused this problem. Not knowingly, but now you know more, you can do better. You're going to practice scientifically, but with passion in everything that you do. I urge you all now to become politically active. We're going to have each of you be members on us of the Student American Medical Association. I want you to be more than a physician. I really truly believe you can be a better physician by being more than a physician. I want you to educate each other. Educate us. Educate your patients. Educate your family. And educate forever. Talk about the magic. This is what's been lost in my estimation. This is a field of unbelievable magic. But many of us have gotten tired. Many of us have gotten weighed down. And we're not talking about the magic anymore. Let's go back to talking about the magic. Promote the privilege of caring for others. This isn't a burden. It's an incredible privilege. And I ask you all, in everything you do, in every patient interaction, to care, to care deeply. Anybody tell me who these two are? Very good, Watson and Crick. A few short years ago, I had the pleasure of having dinner with James Watson. And his son has schizophrenia, something he openly lectures about. And he's still working in his 80s. And he's looking at the genetics of human behavior. And when asked why, he answered simply, perhaps if I can prove that human behavior is genetically controlled, we can start becoming more tolerant of one another. What are the problems? We have a definite increased need. More physicians are retiring, baby boomer generation, career changes, many people working part-time, the Affordable Care Act, all these things have guaranteed you major league job security. You are going to be needed at the time you finish your residency more than any time in medical history. The opportunities are out there. Yes, we need primary care physicians, but to care for us, the baby boomers, we need physicians in every specialty in every area. So your opportunities are going to be boundless. Is there an effective reimbursement? Of course there is. And much of that is because of the errors we did in overbilling and overprescribing and overtesting. We're going to fix all that. You're going to fix all that. You're going to have to learn, and you're going to want to learn, to practice medicine as a team rather than an individual, to look at physician extenders, to look beyond yourself when it comes to caring. And I'm going to give you a little bit of my experience. I've had the honor of caring for patients as a physician for over 31 years. And here's what I learned. The reason my practice got busy, the reason I looked forward to coming to work every day, the reason my waiting room was filled was not because I knew the Krebs cycle, not because I knew all these medical terms, but I made sure, and it was more for me than for them, that as every patient walked out the door, they knew 
that I cared about them while they were there. And if they knew that, when they went home, they told their family members, they told their neighbors, your practices will grow because you care. Those patients will benefit from that, but you will as well. So I urge you now today, don't let anything get in the way of that caring. If you get tired along the way, we have resources to help you with that. If you feel you're overwhelmed, come to us. Anyone in this room, we will help you with that. Never, ever let anything get in the way of what got you here. Each and every one of you were picked, not just because of your incredible metrics, but mostly because of the road you traveled, because of who you are, because of what you're going to bring to each and every patient that you're going to see, because of the difference you can make. Don't let anything get in the way of that. So how do you define being a doctor? Each and every one of us will tell you, when that door closes and it's just you and the patient, it's total magic. It's more fun than you should ever be allowed to have. People will tell you things that you don't want to hear. <laughs> People will tell you things they don't tell their significant other. People will share thoughts, share feelings, share pain. That's amazing. That's magic. Each and every day you're going to solve problems. That is total fun. It's puzzles. It's games. It's things that are going to challenge you. Things that call on you to read, to think, to act, to consult, to draw on your past history. Problem solving is so much fun. You're going to impact the lives of people. And most of the time, you won't even recognize that that's what you are doing. That's part of the magic. Each and every day, you will learn. Forever, you will learn. Total self-renewal. It's an incredible honor, and one that I know that you already feel. But you'll also find fulfillment in the everyday things of being a doctor. Just being able to help a patient off an exam table calling somebody to tell them their mammogram was normal, knowing they'd be worried about that. You're going to really enjoy this. It used to be, when those pictures were up, the only thing that people cared about was the patient. Now, it's very important that you put a lot of emphasis on your personal life, and we're going to ask you to add another circle. Yes, think about your patient, work to be the best physician you can be, but work to be the best person you can be. The best spouse, relative, father, coach, anything. But then look beyond that and look to society. We've not paid enough attention to society, which is why we're in the problem we're in now. So the problems, cost of care, we have to ration. Rationing is not a bad thing. It's what intelligent people do every day based on facts. The Affordable Care Act is going to help access to care. We have to push it much farther than that. We have to become one respected voice. The profession of medicine has become segmented. Surgeons, anesthesiologists, primary care physicians. It's one profession. For us to change things, we have to act as one. Yes, we have superbugs. If we practice evidence-based medicine, we probably wouldn't. You're going to learn how to. We want to educate the public. There's information overload. You're going to learn here over the next four years how to manage that. Okay? Malpractice costs, don't worry about that. If you are and you will be great physicians and you care, this will go away. Reimbursement, don't worry about that either. By patients knowing that you care, there will never be a question about that. I, every day, try to be more than just a physician. And the way I look at it is before I go to bed at night, and I look back and I say I'm a father, a husband, a friend, a brother, a teacher, a doctor, a basketball coach, a carpenter, the chances I screwed up at every single one of those that day is pretty low. 
So I tend to remember the one thing that I happened to do by luck very well that day, close my eyes and go to sleep. Okay? Role models, teach, burn out, get help, change will help you with that. So the challenge of practice is weighing the aggravation and the rewards. I'm telling you right now, the rewards every single day far outweigh those aggravations. To be able to prevent disease, to talk somebody into a colonoscopy, to me, that's the real magic of medicine. <laughs> okay? And I've done this and have people where you found a malignant polyp that they were able to be cured by the colonoscopy itself. Where else do you get to do that as a profession? To treat illness, to just listen to patients. 80% of diagnosis is just listening. And I know you can do that because I've seen all your videos. Uh, learning every day. You will be respected in this profession, but you will have to earn it and you will. The lifestyle's pretty good. The hours, they're fun. The little things, the card that you get from somebody, the little note, the box of candy is my favorite, of course. But more importantly, the stories. In this profession, you will gather stories that no one at the dinner table will believe. You will learn to completely de-identify all of these stories, but there are so many stories to tell. Why were you chosen? For the future, here are the key skills. We need intelligent physicians. You are incredibly intelligent. But we need people who are honest. This is an essential trait. We need people who can work as a team. We need people who don't take themselves too seriously. We need people that are very flexible because I'm going to tell you now, you're not going to be able to predict a single day for the rest of your life. You have to be very, very flexible. And you have to be humble. The other guarantee that I will make is you will be wrong. And that will teach you. And I want you to care. You say, oh, if I care and my patient gets sick or they die, that'll be painful. That means you really cared. That's a good thing. The good of caring far, far outweighs the bad. So what's not going to change in the years that lie ahead of you? That magic behind the door isn't going to change. The ability to learn every day, job security. Here are some thoughts. These are, as you'll soon learn, McGeeanisms. And the McGeeanisms are the zone. Each of you are here because you know what the zone is. The zone is, have any, has anybody read through this incredible chapter. And when the last word was finished, not a single word went into your head. Right? And there are other days you'll pick up this complex scientific theory and it makes sense to you right away. In the first instance, you weren't in the zone. In the second, you were. Being in the zone is an amazing place to be. Not everybody feels that or understands that. But the message I want to give you is that when you're not in the zone, don't study. Go out and do things to get yourself in the zone. And they are things to promote your physical and emotional health. Socialize. Exercise. Take care of this incredible vehicle we have been given. Be happy. Do things that make you happy. Because then you'll need to study less. Because everything will go right in. The personal statement. Jocelyn, Kate, and I had the chance to read your personal statements, which is partly why you're here. What I'd like you to do today, this is your only homework assignment today, pull it up, print it out, read it. Look at it and say, is this my mission statement for the next 50 years? If it is, Embrace it. Keep it somewhere that you can refer to it regularly to stay on track. If it's not, rewrite it. Just as our school needs a mission statement and is going to stick by it in all we do, I encourage you to do the same thing. The next is dealing with feelings. 
Medicine is a very hard profession to learn. You are going to see things that few people see. You'll be in that beautiful anatomy lab that we've created on the sixth floor. But what you're going to do there is rather odd. It can really get to you. And people deal with that by sometimes making jokes about it, by making light of it. It's a big deal. When you go to our emergency room and you see a trauma victim come in, when you see a young person die, all of these things are going to affect you deeply. And I encourage you right now to deal with that each and every time, at the time, and deal with it properly. Talk to others about it. Talk to your best friend. Share it. Because if you start locking those feelings up in a box, you'll find later in life you can't get them out of the box. And you can't relate to your patients, and you can't relate to your family. Don't let that happen. So here are some of my thoughts. By caring for yourself and those you love, you'll become a better caregiver to others. Intelligence, and you are all incredibly intelligent, is not wisdom. And over these next four years, allow us to impart some wisdom. You impart your wisdom to us. But then at the end of those four years, recognize that's just the beginning. You have to keep becoming wiser and wiser. Be honest, but mostly be honest to yourself. One of the curses of intelligence is the ability to trick yourself. Don't ever do that, okay? Be more than a physician to become a better physician, but each and every day, find happiness in everything you do, but don't keep it to yourself. Share it with each other, share it with us. One of the greatest little quotes is Francis Weld Peabody, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1927. The secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. Thank you. Thank you, John. Congratulations to all of you. Well, in keeping with the Olympic spirit, let the games begin.